Thank you, and thank you for this invitation. So I understand uh, that this is the first case in the series of three cases across this meeting. Uh, and uh, what I was uh, requested to show is the clinical case on both initiation and switching. So I thought to incorporate that into uh, somehow a little bit complex um, person. But let's first start with my disclosure. So uh, most of the things Caroline has just mentioned. Uh, and I'm working at the Pomer Pomeranian Medical University in, in Poland. Uh, in Szczecin, which is actually the western border of the country, so our nearest large city is Berlin, uh, just so that, you, so that you know that it's not Warsaw. Uh, okay, uh, so since also I have an utmost pleasure of being the associate editor and there is a rollout of a special issue on late presentation, so I thought I would just begin with that a little bit uh, with, uh, we all know that late presentation is associated with increased morbidity, uh, very often multiple opportunistic infections, very often pneumocystodosis, neurotoxoplasmosis, uh, and actually it's one of the key factors for in-hospital admissions. Um, but what we still do not know is how much does, it, does the late presentation and late diagnosis interface with COVID pandemics, how and in what position will we find ourselves, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, from the beginning of pandemics. We have had a decrease in the number of tests performed and we have consistently seen people coming in lately. Okay, so the case. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this case joins two things, joins pandemic and war-associated movement. So here I would like to present 31-year-old female Ukrainian war migrant. And actually, to, to state it correctly, the migration was in uh, January, so it was just before the war broke, but we still consider these people to be associated with uh, war, or war migration, unvaccinated against COVID with two children. And uh, you probably have seen multitude of such cases in the COVID pandemics. So this is a typical COVID case which is coming into the hospital due to COVID pneumonia with low baseline saturation, uh, with uh, actually very uh, advanced disease in the lungs so initial CT scan without contrast is showing 80% of lungs, which we will correct uh, in, a, in a subsequent slide. There is no concomitant diseases whatsoever, so no concomitant drugs uh, ever taken, and basically no history, and it's just a week of fevers, dyspnea, and cough as a history. And uh, let's take a look at the first commentary uh, which I wanted to, to do alongside this case. So when we look at people who are now coming into care uh, related to war migration, we have these four categories. And this is the first one. This is the category in red. So this is a person who was uh, previously undiagnosed, uh, late presenter, obviously, uh, with language barrier. Uh, this means that uh, we have to communicate uh, in Ukrainian or sometimes Russian. Uh, I do not speak uh, neither of the languages, uh, but many of all the doctors in Poland do. And then we have these people who just declare posse, posse by care, so just come in for the drug refill, undisclosed to somebody who was already living in Poland, but never said that they are HIV positive, and they were coming for the drug refills to Ukraine and back and people who enter care, so they declare temporary or not stay and care entry. Uh, but let's do the second comment. Uh, as of vaccination in Ukraine, uh, this is the data from February 2022. Uh, as you could see, generally, uh, the rollout of vaccination against COVID uh, is not as uh, as extensive and as is in Western and Southern Europe. And please remember anyways that there is a gradient in the uh, vaccine uh, rollout, even for Poland, it's 10% lower than in Southern and uh, 
Western Europe, 34% of people fully vaccinated and 2% with a booster dose. Okay. Uh, we also have developed across COVID a small uh, artificial intelligence based uh, uh, tool. So these are the lungs of a, of a lady. Uh, so actually this is uh, the tool which is assessing precisely how much percentage is um, infiltrated with division into ground glass called in, called consolidated infiltrates and there is like approximately 60% of the lungs. Okay, so here the things begin to be interesting. So if we look at the baseline results, we would not be very far from actually the COVID case. Uh, the lymphopenia might be in COVID, the platelate count might be in COVID, uh, interleukin-6 of 50, uh, which is between the replication and uh, a cytokine storm, uh, slight d dimer increase and LDH, and obviously antigen detectable, uh, with high CT uh, in the PCR, CMV serology positive, toxopositive, and ELISA, which we basically try to do in everybody who is admitted due to COVID, except for aging people, is also highly reactive uh, with confirmed by serological line immunoassay testing. Also, uh, if we have doubts, we do the TB testing. So uh, RIF TB PCR is negative and acid phase bacilli is negative. Obviously, this is not at baseline. This takes a few days. Okay, so they, let's take a look at the HIV status. And these are the exact true results of the lady. One uh, CD4 cell, precisely one, with a ratio of zero. Uh, HIV RNA of 990,000 subtype A, no drug resistance. And then, Cryptococcus antigen is negative, but the CMV DNA from serum is uh, 77,000 copies. So we've got the second thing to think of. So we've got a newly diagnosed COVID, AIDS, and CMV in the same patient. So we also, like, presumptively diagnosed PCP. Obviously, we didn't have PCR to confirm this here. Okay. So now the first treatment, remdesivir for 10 days, uh, coalescent plasma, two units. Uh, again, second remdesivir for 15 days plus molnupiravir. Uh, and the lady remained antigen, COVID antigen positive for more than six weeks after all that. Uh, also on top of that, cotrimoxazole, prednisolone, gancyclovir, and fluconazole. So this is the case which I wanted to show you for consideration of initiation of antiretroviral therapy. So where do we go with CART actually? Where, what, what might we consider? And these are EAG's guidelines for you. Uh, everybody knows this. It was discussed today uh, very extensively. Uh, so should we go for dolutegravir-based regimen, bictegravir, dual regimen? I don't think so. Uh, Doravirin perhaps? Maybe yes, maybe not. Protease inhibitors, maybe. Okay, so I've checked all the drug, drug interactions for the, uh, for the baseline treatments that we had, uh, mostly, and everything is more or less green across the, this first line regimen. So we are safe to go here. So thank you, say, for the stool again, and it is very useful. But then we always have in the back of our minds the TB. Uh, maybe there will be unmasking TB here uh, because the situation is very complex. There is one CD4. So once we start the treatment, we always worry about that. Uh, so obviously we think somewhere in the back of our minds uh, about the rifampicin drug-drug interactions. We do not have rifabutin on the site. Already we have to uh, request for that and it takes from four to six weeks to get it. So we try to optimize antiretrovirals beforehand. Okay, the patient was started maybe well, maybe not well, on TDFFTC plus raltegravir. And actually this was a virological success. So the viremia dropped down very quickly. Uh, but 
I wanted to make your life easy. So this is what happened after starting. Uh, so in case of somebody not familiar with radiology, the uh, left, uh, sorry, uh, yes, the left lung collapsed completely, so this is pneumothorax. And actually, after a thoracosurgical intervention, after two weeks, it burst again uh, with another pneumothorax and right-sided also uh, large lesion. Actually, this is where our artificial intelligence tools stop working. So artificial is artificial, as it says. Uh, so radiologist is useful because it just sees the hazy stuff and absolutely unreliable. Uh, but the, in the end, the patient survived miraculously uh, with the decrease in viral load. It took some time to get some CD4s. Uh, obviously started on PCP secondary and CMV secondary prophylaxis and tiny bit of body mass increase. So this is the first part. And now let's try to go a little bit to the future since there is a discussion ahead of us. So this is the theoretical part of this case. So this didn't happen yet. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But let's assume that the, pain, that the patient is stable on undetectable uh, treatment for two and a half years approximately and we've gained CD4 count to more than 300 and she's tired of pill counts she wants a normal life but she's also a migrant who is afraid of stigma this is a very important issue understand it as of now okay uh, my question would be would you consider uh, lie with cabotegravir rilpivirin. And actually I've been nasty here uh, because we have to go back to this slide which, uh, which was also uh, presented by Danielle and we have to think about factors which contribute to risk of treatment failure with lie cabotegravir rilpivirin. And we remember uh, RAM baseline for rilpivirin, uh, through concentration, subtype and BMI. So let's remind ourselves of a subtype, which I just jumped very quickly uh, from uh, here. So there is a tiny mutation uh, in the integrase associated with uh, the A subtype. Uh, Rilpivirin is susceptible, but the subtype is actually A6. And watch out, because REGA uh, tool is not, is not assigning A1 and A6 Correctly, we've got a huge data set of A6 sequences. They are all assigned as A1. So since we are in the virology education and pre-HIV um, resistance meeting, I added these slides uh, as well. So this is a one factor, uh, not very strong, but not the weakest either, uh, of the uh, lie, uh, lie uh, of a risk of life failure with cabotegravir rilpivirin. So would you think this would be enough to actually uh, not give light to such a person? And uh, the last slide is on the tiny um, comment again, uh, what's going on with A6 in Central Europe. Uh, you remember that A1, or actually probably A6 uh, subtype is the most common subtype in the eastern part of Europe and we in Poland have seen over the last years significant increase in A6 subtypes we have published on that and it's the second most prevalent subtype now uh, out of subtype B and we see on the right uh, these between yellow dots and red dots these are introductions actually uh, from Ukraine to Poland of subtype A6 so we will probably see that. And another question which is being opened here, maybe for further discussions, will be, will PrEP with fly be as efficacious in the setting where, where subtype A is prevalent? This question was already asked today, and it may be considered for the future. Thank you very much.